You're listening to Conversations with Shanta, a podcast that unpacks the community's grittiest, most vexing problems, hosted by Shonda Smith-Baker. This episode is sponsored by the Black Collective Foundation, a philanthropic movement advancing the genius of Black-led change. The Black Collective Foundation is Minnesota's first Black community foundation working to create a thriving ecosystem of Black-led change. Together, they are advancing the genius of Black-led change and building a community where all Black people are holistically well and living in dignity and prosperity. To learn more, go to minnesotablackcollectivefoundation.org. In this episode, Shauna interviews two civic leaders, Wenda Weeksmore and Phyllis Goff, live at the Minnesota Black Collective Foundation Tour, introduced by Lulit Mola. Listen in as they discuss childhood experiences of giving, to addressing racial disparities, building trust in philanthropy, and insights on leadership, courage, and making a lasting impact. Enjoy the show. All right, now it is our time for the Conversations with Shonda live podcast recording. Here are the superstars coming out now. So as they get settled in, I'll say this. We would have asked Shonda to do this if she was not a co-founder of the Black Collective. We had to book her, okay? Because in addition to being a co-founder, Shonda is also rooted in community. She understands philanthropy. She understands change in the future and the change that has come before us. And she threads all of that so beautifully in this award-winning podcast. Sign up to her newsletter if you haven't had a chance to do so. And really, Shonda, thank you so much for being here with Ms. Wenda Weeksmore and Phyllis Goff. Um, And now I give you Conversations with Shonda. This is exciting. What what I've said uh, to my guest here is that we are at a kitchen table having a conversation about what we need in philanthropy, and you guys just get to witness it. So this is Conversation with Shonda, a podcast that I started because I felt a need to be in experiences with others and how they were leading and making a difference in community. So that is what we're gonna talk about. We're gonna talk to two giants in my mind You see these faces, two giants in my mind. (laughs) Phyllis Goff and Wenda Weeks Moore. So thank you so much for agreeing to be in conversations with Shonda and in front of this audience of change makers and difference makers in our community. I welcome you. Thank you. So this morning, we started out at Fellowship Missionary Baptist Church on a tour And we talked about the role of the black church and a question came up around the giving that happens in church in terms of philanthropy. So many of us have that experience in an informal way, have been philanthropic since we were very young. We've experienced it, but we didn't name it that. We just didn't name it that. And so just to ground us in the conversation, I would love it if you could talk about an early experience or the first time you remember experiencing what philanthropy is. I um, experienced philanthropy, and and I'm talking about uh, not informal, but formal philanthropy, when I was about uh, 10 or 11. My dad was the first in his family to go to college. He was the son of immigrants from Barbados. And so he worked his way through college, Howard University, and medical school. When I was 10 or 11, he took me and my sister and my brother with my mom back to Howard University to establish a scholarship for a needy medical school student. And being the oldest and feeling like it was my responsibility to communicate issues, I said to my dad shortly after that, I don't understand You work so hard, Dad, you know, because he was never home. He was home, but it felt like he was never home because he was always delivering babies. And I said, I don't understand when you work so hard for your money that you would just give it away to people that we don't know. And bless his heart, (laughs) he looked at me and he said, you are enjoying a life and a lifestyle because someone who did not know me 
gave money so that I could go to Howard University, go to medical school, and this is the result. And so I have an obligation to the people I don't know who need the money in order to fulfill their dreams. Mm. And I was like, got it. <laughs> I got it. You got I've it. never forgotten it. I've never forgotten it. Yeah, such an incredible story. Oh. I'll share three experiences of my early recognition of philanthropy, and this is more informal philanthropy, um, but then I'll share one quick experience about how I later figured out how to name it. And so the first three experiences are, just as Shonda said, you know, you're three and four years old, they come around at, at church with the collection plate, and your parents sneak you a nickel or a dime or a quarter, and you put it in the collection plate. And, and you did it every Sunday without fail. And so it was natural and it wasn't considered charitable giving. It wasn't considered philanthropy. It's just what you did as a child very early. And then secondly, um, my grandmother started a community club in my small town because the black cemeteries that were public cemeteries were not maintained by the city they only maintained the white cemeteries. And so she started a club to do fundraising to hire people who would cut the grass and maintain the black cemeteries in town. And I always remembered that. And then my father always brought home these envelopes from the American Red Cross. And I didn't think anything of it, but it's that naming it later that made me realize that I was surrounded by a family of giving at an early age. And how I named it was in my corporate world much later, they uh, talked about this um, method of learning called three-way learning. And it's where someone teaches you something, that's one, you learn it, that's two, and then you teach it to someone else, that's three. And I named it because as an adult, I was sitting in church once and I had my cousin of the next generation sitting next to me and her little niece sitting next to her. And I saw her give her little niece a quarter when the collections came around. And I thought, my God, three-way learning. And so it all came to naming it in terms of we've all, as a black community, we've always been giving. Mm -hmm. We've always been caring. And that's not unique to our race, but it is something that we proudly hold as our race. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. And what that brings up for me is that, you know, at the Black Collective and Phyllis, we've had these conversations around how do we invite communities to be engaged in formal philanthropy um, in ways that our current philanthropic institutions are missing. Do you have advice to share on that? How can we encourage? I, 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 well, first of all, you always encourage by modeling and you always encourage by saying to what end? And so if you can share to what end that this is gonna benefit not only the individual doing the giving, but how that that's gonna multiply, I think that that would be, those would be the two big things I would say by modeling and also by making sure that there's some value to what end proposition. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you have anything you want to add to that question? No. No? I think okay. <laughs> I think that's that good. was I good. Like that. that was good. I like that. So, you know, I have a, a special affection for board governance. So do I. I know. It's sort of, <laughs> it's sort of wonky, nerdy little thing, but I do. And I believe in the power of, of governing, um, the power of moving change, the power of supporting the leaders that are in those institutions. Both of you have sat on some really amazing boards. We are in a season where urgency 
is um, the norm. But what role do you think that boards have in actually forwarding long-term change? Wendy, you served on Kellogg board for 29 years? 26 years. 26 years. Yes. What were the challenges and the opportunities that you see that would be useful for those of us in the, in the audience here? Um, you know, when you have an opportunity to serve and um, Mr. Kellogg and his bylaws decided that he wanted us to serve until a certain age. Um, so when you have the luxury of serving on a board for a period of time, you, you develop interest in longitudinal studies and where, where are we going, but it doesn't have to be right now. It doesn't have to be five years from now because you can see the work, continue to watch it grow and build on it. When the commitment is made by a board that isn't going to change every three or four years. We also had the responsibility to hire the CEO. So you bring a CEO who understands what the values of the foundation are, where we're going, what we want to do. Then you have a consistent movement forward. Mm -hmm. The president understands where you want to go, the board understands. Now when I got on the board initially, we couldn't say race. We had a couple of people on the board who had issues with having that word said. And so we're doing work in Detroit, we're doing work in Mississippi, and we're not saying race. And I'm thinking to myself, <laughs> what the heck is going on here? And pretty soon I got to be on board development. And so we started having some experiences. We did some traveling as a board took us to Mississippi. And um, we had very talented staff. The staff arranged for us to meet with some black and some white farmers. The meeting was out in a field. Without any prompting, the white farmers sat on one side, the black farmers were sitting on the other side. And we listened to them talk about the way things were there. And the way things were there meant that the white farmers planted on time because they got the seeds and had the money and whatnot, whatnot. And then they took their product to process and all. The black farmers were always behind. What's interesting about this is when we got in the room with just the trustees, one of the people who had not wanted to say race you never know when, this, when the light bulb is going to go on. Okay. One of the main people who would not allow us to say race said, I'm just burning up. That was just ridiculous out there today. And I'm thinking, I know you're not where I think you are, but he sure was. And for him, it was like it was the key. And we started from there. He retired three years later, so then we really moved into <laughs> to high gear because we knew race was the elephant in the room, whether we were doing work in Detroit, in Mississippi, wherever. Race was the elephant in the room that nobody wanted to talk about. And so we decided to talk about race. Mm -hmm. And now Kellogg is in the top 20 of foundations that are moving race equity work in the country. Yeah. Thank you for that. Phyllis, do you think we're centering race now in philanthropy? Are we centering it now more? Are, are we, we centering, centering it now it? more? Uh, it, it depends on the foundation. Mm -hmm. Okay. And it depends on the community. Um, and I feel like that there was a lot of effort, sincere effort that was put out um, unfortunately, after the murder of George Floyd. And so the whole concept of recognizing racial disparities and seeing it in the moment and not being able to avoid it, uh, I think became very clear. I worry about as time goes by, our memories get short. 
and that we won't have uh, the continued urgency to stick with it and to have the stamina. I'll add one more point to that, and that is I, I was at a presentation yesterday where Akua Ellis was the keynote speaker, and Akua talked about the fact that systems change takes time, and it also takes stick to it it takes stamina, it takes courage, it takes consistency. She, she did a lot with the C's, okay? <laughs> and consistent communications. And so I feel that, yeah, philanthropy, looking at equity being centered is still key, but if we don't stick to it, if we don't continue to have that type of dedicated attention to it, we're gonna eventually step back again. Mm -hmm. I see you nodding your head. Well, I'm just thinking we have to figure out how to make progress without having a crisis. Good point. Can you say more? I, I think that's it. I mean, <laughs> we, have to, we have to consistently do the work. We have to consistent. We shouldn't be going from, you know, a, a crisis shouldn't be the energy that gets us propelled forward. The crisis makes it reactionary. Yeah. And we should not be reactionary. That's right. We should be proactive. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I agree. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So the Black Collective Foundation emerged after the murder of George Floyd. We weren't a foundation when we first emerged. We were a collective. Lolit Rapa and I came into the work and we came out with a statement. And so your story just prompted for me when that statement came out um, that we asked foundations to sign on to that talked about combating anti-blackness. And there were some foundations that immediately signed on we got some phone calls that says, we like everything except for the words combating anti-blackness. Like our boards just aren't gonna go for that. Can you just take this word out? Can you add this word instead? Can you do this instead? And there was moments of pure exhaustion and frustration on the part of us co-founders because we thought that we had gotten to a place in the community with the disparities that we have that we could actually talk about race. And we have gotten better, but that's what that brought up for me, that moment of trying to navigate around race when it is the elephant in the room. Mm -hmm. And when you name it, you gotta do something about it. Yep. <laughs> that's right. That was direct. <laughs> and, and as you name it, it's real important that there are some people who may be uncomfortable. And if it's worth it to try to steer them along, it's important to try to meet them where they are. And I say that to say, somebody might have been uncomfortable with saying anti-black, that we need to el eliminate anti-black behavior and maybe they can never be convinced. But there are a lot of people out there who can be convinced. And if you take the time, going back to what Akua says, systems change takes time. If you take the time, we can actually bring more people along who can actually be better ambassadors, be better advocates for equity that's true equity. But you know, I think one of the things that ha happens um, and has to occur, I think um, trustees especially having the responsibility for making uh, policy and for supporting the work of the program directors, um, those trustees need to get out in the field yeah. and see what is really happening. We had a board trip every year and we had 100% participation in those board trips. It doesn't matter how well program officers describe a situation or where the grant work is being done. 
Nothing can take the place of meeting those people, seeing those people, and feeling what they're feeling when you're in their communities. And you do. Hmm. You do. Um, one of the first trips I took um, was to Alabama, and it was a water project that Kellogg had funded. I had no idea that the water project meant that the water would come to a spigot at the end of the lane in these rural communities, and they would take a bucket to the spigot down the lane to get the water. Mm. You, some of this stuff, you just you, you have to get out, you have to feel it to understand why movement has to be made. And that was part of the education that we had for our board. Mm -hmm. And that's why we were able to get finally to where, where we are now. Yeah, the, the lesson that I'm taking from this right now are um, numerous, but one of them is there is a level of impatience right now with the lack of movement mm -hmm. for many people. That sitting at the tables, like I can envision people that would go to a place, sit on a board in which they were not comfortable talking about race and remove themselves from that table, mm -hmm. right? That these people just don't know what's going on. I can't be here. It's not aligned with me. But in fact, you were able to stay at the table and find ways that weren't loud, but strategic in the point of advancing strategy, strategically moving people along from where they were. But you have to know who they are to do that. Well, and that's one of the advantages we had. We, we met monthly. Woof. That's Can right. you imagine preparing those board packets? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We met monthly. Yeah. And when you do that, you become a family. Yeah. You know, I saw some of those people more often than I did my relatives. And you get to know them, they get to know you. It makes a difference. Yeah. It makes a difference. Mm -hmm. and you then, have to start with good people. Yeah. You have to start with good people. But yeah. it makes a difference. I was going to say, and they, they get to know your life experiences mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. how your life experiences are different mm -hmm. because of your race, but how the whole sense of humanity you both share. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Did you find new places of courage within yourselves when you have sat at these tables? And if so, what did that look like? I guess my real moment of confronting what all of this was going to be like came at one of my board meetings. It was the first or the second. It was during the lettuce boycott, Cesar Chavez and in uh, California. And the students have been asking for a bowl of union lettuce and non-union lettuce. And that was a decision that uh, they brought to the regions. And this group came in as we started the meeting. And because I had just gone on the board, I was sitting at the end of the table. And so I'm facing them and I'm trying to figure out what is the issue and what can we do about that issue. It seems we're not the people to talk to about lettuce in the cafeteria. At any rate, <laughs> I noticed kind of movement behind me, you know, when it's when all, everything's happening here. And finally, one of the regents came and said to me, um, come on now, we're leaving. We're going in the in the president's office, which is connected to the to the at that time to the boardroom. And we got in the room and there was chit chat, chit chat. And then that was the end of the meeting. I drove home that night from the university and I thought to myself, I am never doing that again. Hmm. I am not going to sit in this space, which is sacred when you are a trustee of any of these um, institutions. I'm not gonna sit in this space and not ask what I need to ask so that people, when they come with their issues, know, I have heard that. I hear you, whatever the issue is. 
And it's not about being polite. It's about doing your job when you sit in these positions. And if you don't have the courage to do it, don't say yes. Let somebody who has the courage sit in that seat. Because it does take courage. Mm -hmm. but, I, <laughs> but I just think they are, uh, it's very important. And I didn't want to end up years later because all of this is positional power too. I think that's another thing you have to understand. Yeah. I was not going to be filled with a lot of, I wish I had, oh, if I had just talked then, if I had just asked this question, I was not going to be that person. That's why I rest easy every night. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 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 That part, right? LaCora, that part. Okay. Yeah. Uh, rest easy because I did what I was supposed to do when That's I got right. there. That's right. There are a lot of people that sit on boards that I've experienced that don't read the materials. <laughs> They're there for resume. And boards have a lot of power to move change if they take it seriously. So, Ms. Phyllis, was there a moment of courage that, that you recall or, because you sort of grow into it a little bit, right, uh, with influence and other things, but do you have moments in which you've had to exercise courage or what does that look like in your board leadership or in your, philanthropy, in your work in philanthropy? Your question reminds me of two things. First of all, I want to reinforce what Wenda has already said about being with board members constantly enables you to build trust and start to respect each other's life experiences. And so what I found was that as I was building trust with my fellow board members, they were building trust with me and they were allowing me to find my voice and giving me, therefore, the courage to, to say time out, this doesn't make sense, or time out, this adversely affects one group of people over another. And so I feel that it does, it, it grows. And the more you build trust, the more you're able to be able to call out the disparities in a way that helps to make the best policy decisions going forward. Um, the one moment that I can think of was actually with the McKnight Foundation. And one of uh, my fellow board members said something to the effect that we need to start to support our black men. That our black men are being dis disproportionately treated differently with racist uh, attitudes. And it occurred to me, here is a, a white woman making a courageous statement like that. I need to say, I agree that we need to look at programs that can help rise everybody up and do a focus on our African-American men in Minnesota. So that was a courageous moment for me that I even, I even then said, I've heard Josie Johnson talk about that. And I heard Josie Johnson give that in an acceptance speech when she got an award from the St. Paul and Minnesota Foundation. And it is true that where people are adversely affected, we need to call it out. Mm -hmm. And we need to be really more intentional about righting the wrongs. Mm -hmm. Agreed. While there are challenges that we are navigating, there's lots of good things happen, good trouble happening in community. And so, um, Ms. Phyllis, what are you excited about that you're seeing and what are the opportunities you believe are out there for us in philanthropy? I wanna, I wanna do a shout out to the fact that all of you who are in this room are in this room for a reason. That's exciting. Mm -hmm. And I do feel like that's building the momentum that we need to build to not only affect everybody in this room and how you are able to affect others, but that we're also bringing up the next generation of kids who will make it even better. So that's my biggest excitement, that there is momentum. Mm -hmm. And my biggest fear is that we're gonna lose that momentum if we don't stay with it. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, Ms. Wanda. Um, I, I just look forward to seeing how the next generation will identify and decide to attack some of these issues. I feel I worked very hard when I was um, sitting at the table. And I feel satisfied in what I was able to do and what the boards I was on were able to do. But I also appreciate that the younger generations have a different way of looking at life, of looking at things and doing things and all of it. I can't believe how my grandsons can work my phone when I <laughs> look at it and, and, you know, Grammys, I told you before, you know, do this, do this when this happens. I just am looking forward to the way you're going to attack some of these issues because I hope you bring all of your creativity and also some of the lessons learned because we've all tried. We, we did our best and I think we've made some movement, but we, and I know you know, we need to make a lot more movement forward. Mm -hmm. So I'm just excited about the innovation that's going to come and all the wonderful minds that are going to focus on some of these issues now. Wonderful. You want to, you want to add? I can see you. Well, you know, <laughs> <laughs> so as we look at the innovation and the great gifts and creativity of our younger generation, we need to make sure that it's grounded in just historical relevance because I have to tell a story that Lou Bellamy once told me. He's, Lou Bellamy, the founding and artistic director for Penumbra Theater, he was in college doing his master's work and um, a professor was trying to convince him that he needed to learn more about Shakespeare. And he says, I don't wanna do Shakespeare, that's old stuff, I wanna do new stuff. And the professor said to him, well, how will you know? Mm. And he realized you can't learn about doing innovation and doing new stuff if you don't know what's come before you. And so for me, it's important that we don't hold back the innovation and the creativity and what the next generation needs, but it's important to keep all of us grounded in what has come before us so that we're not only building on that, but as they say, if you don't know your history, you're doomed to repeat it, that we're not making the same mistakes again. Thank you. Do we have any audience questions? I'm fascinated. You each operated at some point as the only in your work. For people in the audience that are the only, what's your advice for them to stay in the work? Mm. Find friends outside of the only who you can relate to. So I may be the only person on a board, but Wenda is the only person on another board. And so we can uh, prop each other up, inspire each other, commiserate with each other, and learn from each other. Mm -hmm. I have been the only, but I made it, uh, I just made it my business to win people over. Mm -hmm. So I had connections because you can't, you can't move stuff forward if you can't work the people on the board. It's a horrible thing to say, and I'm sorry if anybody doesn't like that terminology, but when you're trying to move forward on meaningful issues, you have to have people understand you understand um, the fact that you're coming from a place of truth and uh, there's, there's a need to listen and to understand, uh, to move forward. So I always made it my business to get connected, get to know. I had some people on, the, on boards that were surprised. We ended up best friends almost mm. uh, because you have to do that. You're working with them and there has to be a level of trust 
And you have to, if you're the only, you have to take the first step to start building that trust. What I think I appreciate, I do appreciate this conversation, but what in this last exchange is because often people will highlight being the only. And what I heard from you, Ms. Phyllis, is you're not the only only. <laughs> Right? You're not the only only. Right. There's other onlys out there. And so where are the people you need to sustain you in the work? So how have you been sustained? How did you how are you sustaining yourself in the work? Like is it is it building that community around you? Like what what has sustained you in this work? I have parents, grandparents, uncles and aunts that came before me. Mm -hmm that not only helped sustain me, but made me feel like I didn't have any other choice. <laughs> and so it, therefore it was natural that I keep at it in order to keep at, keep at the work. Mm -hmm. And what I heard from you, Ms. Wanda, is you are there to do a job, right? And part of your job is, and responsibility is to, if you really are about moving change, then you have to understand who you're moving change with. So even if you're the only, you're not the only one responsible for moving that change. That's right. And so you have to build relationships across identity to be able to do that work. And as you do that and build trust and share, people's minds will shift. Yes. Their perspectives will shift. Yes, and the foundation for me was Howard University. Um, I attended integrated schools in Los Angeles and um, had a great experience. But I will never forget freshman orientation. One of the last sessions we had, the uh, vice president for student affairs, after all the main work had been done, came to the mic and said, um, to all of us who were sitting in the audience, you are the leader your community is waiting for. Mm, very good. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm turning to my friend, what did he say? <laughs> and just, uh, it's like he heard me saying that. So he said, you mm. are the leader your community is waiting for. You have four years here. Be about the business of learning what you need to learn to go back to your community and face some of the issues that we have so that you are prepared to help your community make positive change. Here, here. Mm -hmm. I never forgot Carl Anderson. I will never forget him because that's the first time, and I was the oldest in my family, so I was kind of a leader, but it was the first time somebody said, you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. You know. And what's the importance of saying you? You can't deflect it. Hmm. It's coming for you. And so in 1969, when my neighbors asked me to run for school board, I heard that man's voice in my head. Oh, wow. And I said, yes, I'll run for school board. So I, I just, you never know how people are gonna impact you. Be careful with your words, mm -hmm. especially with our young people. Pour positive messages into them. They have enough garbage coming at them. Believe in our young people. Believe in our young people. Hear, hear. Mm -hmm. You wanna add anything else? I can't, mm -hmm. <laughs> other than, Amen. <laughs> amen and amen and amen, as they say in the church. Um, you know, I just have to share that, um, Ms. Wenda, when you left the Kellogg Board, you were honored as you should have been. There was a gift that you made to the Women's uh, Foundation of Minnesota. And she doesn't know this, but I was at the next table when um, you were being honored in that space. What I want to say here is that while I was at church, at fellowship, I would see Karen Kelly Arula, who was at the Minneapolis Foundation, sitting in the, in the front. 
And I remember being distracted and being like, whatever she does, I think that's what I want to do. I don't have a name. And I remember thinking something similar when I was sitting at that table next to, you know, next to Miguel McMoore, thinking, man, I hope that I have the honor and the privilege to be this impactful. Oh. Bless your heart. <laughs> And I say to you, Ms. Phillips, you know, there have been some challenging times and I will open up an email and I will have an email from you. And why I think this is important, because when you say, you know, be careful with your words, is that, and you talked about modeling. The reason why I felt like this conversation was so necessary is because you guys have been so careful with your words and you have modeled so well. And so thank you for that. Thank you. Because there's so many of us that are watching. I even feel like emotional about it. There's so many people watching um, not good models. Mm. But there are so many exemplary models of women and leaders and black folks in this community that often we are distant from, right? Like some of us have access, but many people don't have access. And so the telling of our stories and leadership is so profoundly important because it's been so profoundly important for me. And so I just want to just say thank you and have the audience thank you for, for having the honor of listening to you both. Thank you. Thank you. Miss Wonder Weeks more Phyllis Golf. Thank you. This was Conversations with Shonda. <laughs> well, I was going to say, let's also give a round of applause for Shonda, Shonda. Smith Baker. Get yeah. here. Get here. What is on my heart? This week has been challenging. We have had significant loss in our community this week. It is a season of memories that we are coming into that all of us are equipped to move and navigate in relationships. And that is a privilege because everyone doesn't have that. The work that we are about is life changing and life saving. Hmm. That when we are at the tables that we are at, we often isolate and we feel the weight. But that weight is shared. And so the work of the Black Collective Foundation is to be an anchor to alleviate the weight of the work, to invite you into community that loves and cares and recognizes your brilliance, knows that you are necessary, know that you are an ally to each other, that we can back each other's plays, even if we come from different directions, that when we disagree, we do that in love. And when we move forward together, we do that in love. And so I am just in a season of reflection and hopefulness, even in the midst of all of it. And so I thank you for everything that you do, said and unsaid, seen and unseen, because I know you are taking on things that were above what you imagined. When you took them on that field, you may not have imagined what would happen later for them being in the top 20, but you knew it in the spirit that you were laying the ground for something better. We are laying the ground for something better. And so thank you for the better that you bring every day. Thank you. That's the perfect way to wrap up our day, Shonda. Thank you to all of you. Together, we're supporting Black-led change like it's already winning. Have a wonderful day. <laughs> to explore more insightful conversations and stay updated on Shonda Smith-Baker's work, visit our new website at smithbaker.co. That's smithbaker.co.